Thank you. Thank you. I tell you what, just uh, Will's desire and passion and everything he's doing here today, you know, I think he, he probably deserves a round of applause. Amen. So, today we're here to, to talk about the father effect. Uh, the significant lifelong impact that dads have on their kids. And the reason I do what I do is because I don't believe most dads really understand the impact and the influence they have. And so I'm going to share a little bit of my story today. Before we start, I like to do something uh, that makes me feel a little more at home as I speak. I live in a house full of women. I have three daughters and a wife, and I can't win. I went and bought a dog not long after my last daughter was, was born, a male dog, and two weeks later, a female dog shows up at our house. So I, there's nothing I can do to win. But one of the things I do is, and some of you we got to visit last night, I have this habit of saying, dude. It's just what I do, how I communicate, right? So I've got my girls, before they say something, they'll say, dude. Like they're, when they're really fixing to lay something on me, they usually start it with dude. Or if they're saying something, they'll finish like, it, like, it's, like it's an exclamation point. Okay? So when I say dude, I need to hear you say dude. Are you ready? Okay, don't blow this now. Are you paying attention? Here we go. Dude. dude. Y'all can do better than that. That is so weak. All right, one more time. Ready? Dude. Dude. That's what I expected more out of you two over here, man. Okay, as we get started, like Will said, we're going to start off with a little short film. This is called The Father Effect. Take a look. was never prepared to be a father. I had no idea how hard it would be or how heavy the responsibility would feel. You know, it doesn't seem right to have that much influence over one small life. The way they look up to you and how easy it is to let them down. Maybe if my dad had been there, it would have been easier. But he wasn't. I grew up most of my life without a father. I can remember his face, but I can't remember a life with him. The last time I saw him, it was on a school day. He was always gone in the mornings, but for some reason he was able to drop me off that day. He even gave me a kiss. I will never forget that day. A few years ago, I was playing golf with a friend of mine. 
and I was sharing with him some of the struggles and trials I was going through at the time. And at one point he turned to me and he said, you grew up without a father, didn't you? And I said, yes. And I went on to give him this great 10 minute explanation about how incredible my mom is. As soon as I finished, he turned to me and he said, but was she a dad? It was at that point that I really began to understand the significant and lifelong impact of growing up without a father. My friend went on to explain the idea of a father wound. He said that many people are wounded by their dads because of their dad's words or actions. Maybe it's a girl who's become promiscuous, never hearing the words I love you from her father. She's willing to do anything to hear them from a man. Maybe it's a son who feels angry, unworthy, or ashamed because of a dad who is physically or verbally abusive, which leads the son into an addiction to cover up the pain. For 30 years, I thought I was the only one struggling with this issue and that I was all alone. As I began to share my story, I soon came to understand that there are millions of people suffering from a father wound. And I discovered the absent father epidemic, which was much bigger than I ever imagined. Either physically or emotionally, an absent father has a profound effect on a son or a daughter. A lack of words, a lack of affirmation can, can be a curse. Um, when a dad's not there, what he's actually saying to you, that you hear loud and clear, even if he never says it, is you're not worth it to me to be here. You're not worth it to me to be here. As I got older, I live in the neighborhood where I'm from, Second Ward, uh, we would go to this park called Ripley House. And when me and my brothers would go to this park, we will walk to the park, we're like 13, 14. We would see these dudes hanging around smoking weed. So when we would go that way, they would stop us, hey, come over here. So we would stop and we started smoking weed. You know, these dudes lived on the next block. They were older cats, you know. I was like 14, they were like 20, 21, you know. I looked up to these dudes because my father wasn't around. I guess that's why I grew up like this. I think if my dad was around, I don't think I'll be here today. Me not having a dad kind of excluded me really believing in anything, believing in anything bigger than me. Left unhealed, the father wound is carried into adulthood and can last a lifetime. If you could say one thing to your father right now, what would it be? Why couldn't you uh, tell me you love me? Because I grew up with a father who was violent and angry and unpredictable, who was scary, my decisions became fear-based. Marriage, because I was afraid to be alone. Sex, because I was afraid he wouldn't love me. I wish that my father could have loved his children more than his love of him. Because no matter how much he maybe did love us or said he loved us, obviously his addiction to gambling meant more to him. It's related to the abandonment. It was related to the sense that I took on as damaged goods, okay? If my dad isn't here caring for me, there's something inherently wrong with me. So I took that with me into the beginning of addiction. I can honestly tell you, I don't remember a time early on that I was doing it for party's sake. The instant that it hit my system, I was like, 
I'm home. I don't feel nothing but good. And all those voices and all that inadequacy, all the shame, all the invisibility, all those things were gone. They were gone. Because my dad chose to abandon me, I was very bitter, angry, and resentful. And it was impacting every aspect of my life. Well, men struggle like being good fathers because they don't know what a good father is supposed to be. They haven't been taught. Um, you can only give what you have. And so most of us as men, not having been taught properly, just do what we kind of think is right. It seems kind of right, but I'm not sure if it's right, but well, heck with it. I don't have time to do anything else. Let's do this. My dad never knew how to be a, a father. He never knew how to be a man. Um, his father was killed uh, when he was two, um, so he wasn't there. And his stepfather um, died not too long um, after he married my grandmother. Um, and my dad just really never had a chance. Um, he never had a father figure there. As I began to understand and hear more stories about my dad, his life, and the way he grew up, God revealed one question to me. How could I be so angry, resentful, and bitter towards a man who didn't know how to be a father? God showed me forgiveness for my dad, and it was because of that forgiveness that I finally became the man, the husband, and the dad that God meant for me to be. And I get to the hospital bed and my dad is completely passed out. And I grabbed his hand. I knew I needed to say it then. And I couldn't even repeat the words that I said. I just know that I, it was full of love and forgiveness and, and wishing him the best. And when I turned around, the nurse had walked into the room while I was talking to my dad. And she was just full of tears. And she said, I, I just didn't want to interrupt you to tell you that he passed away an hour earlier. I said, you know what? I didn't do that for him. I did that for me, and, uh, and I did. It was important for me to truly forgive him in my heart. It's the best thing I've ever done. If you could say one thing to him right now, what would it be? I forgive you. I said to myself, I forgive you. And I did it from the heart. All those years, all those years of resentment were gone. The more I talk to others about their fathers, the good and the bad, the more I came to understand how I could become a better father. What is the worst thing a father can do for his children? Ignore them. Abandon them. Treat them as someone who doesn't matter. And that child perceives that he doesn't matter unless he gets personalized, one-on-one, -on -one, independent, uninterrupted time with dad. I, I think fathers make a mistake when they assume that things will be a good substitute for themselves. So when a dad says, I know, I know I'm working extra hard, but I'm trying to provide good things for you and the kids. I don't know of a kid that would say, oh, dad, please work harder. Don't, don't come to the ball games. Don't spend any time with me, uh, but you know, make lots of money so that I can have everything that I want. If it comes right down to it, they'd rather have you than they would all the stuff. They'd rather have you at their ball game. They'd rather have, have you eat dinner with them. They'd rather have you put them to bed at night. What do you think is the best thing a father can do for his children? Be a man of God. You know, honestly, uh, you can get into the to the accolades of, you know, encouraging your kids and things of that nature. But, you know, I want to be the man that God's called me to be in front of my son. And when I am that man, I walk in a, in a strength and in a presence that I could never accomplish on my own. I have no problem going into my son's room and saying, I just want you to know I messed up. You know, I got angry with you about such and such. 
and would you forgive me for that? And uh, man, that just means the world to him. As children are constructing their understanding of the world, the dads occupy a very central role in that understanding of the world. And their behavior is so critical to giving the child a positive sense of what a good father is and what good male behavior is. The best thing a father can do for his children is love their mother. Uh, but, for, but for a child to see his father love their mother, something happens in that 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 child receives that, that centers their life. Now my dad was not perfect. He had issues. He struggled with stuff all of his life and he didn't have a good influence in his life, but essentially my dad broke that chain and, and raised in me. And now, praise God, I'm raising my kids differently. Do not be afraid. Never parent out of fear. Um, you know, love your kid the best you can. Don't try to be perfect. Keep moving forward. You know, make amends, say you're sorry, but try better the next time, because that's all your kids want. But your greatest calling in life, the impact you're going to make that is greater than any other impact is at home as a dad. I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, man, that guy is so much better looking in person than he is in the movies. Right? Is that what you're thinking? I know this may be tough for some of you because of your father's story, but stay with me here because there's hope and there's a happy ending. I'm not a best-selling author. I don't have a PhD in psychology. I'm not an expert in human behavior, but I am an example of God's life-changing power of forgiveness. I'm an imperfect and flawed individual who drinks way too much Diet Coke and struggles to stop chewing tobacco every day. If I can do this, anybody can do this. For 30 years, I refused to take a step towards God because I was too busy running away from Him. You see, the fact that He let my dad take his own life angered me. I was angry at my dad for leaving and abandoning me, and I was angry at God for allowing him to do it. I had anger in me that was impacting every aspect of my life. I was angry that I couldn't fix a refrigerator if the refrigerator broke down, because I thought, man, every man needs to know or should know how to do that. And my dad's not here, so it was always a reminder of the abandonment and all the issues that I had there. I was angry at everyone, you know, I began to use my hammer, or a hammer, as anger, and everything began to look like a nail. I began to respond in anger to every emotion that I had because it's all I knew, is that I was just an angry, really bitter guy. I was an alcoholic. I traveled the country, had an unlimited expense account, selling plastic. I could walk into any bar and buy the bar around the drinks. I didn't have to answer to anybody about my expenses. I could literally spend any amount of money I wanted. It was the perfect storm because of my issue of alcoholism. And alcoholism was just part of the problem. The real issue was the root. And that root was the abandonment I was suffering because of my dad. You see, we have all these issues and these addictions that we use to cover up that real wound. And man, I loved covering it up. I loved covering it in alcohol. Because then I really didn't have to face the real pain of what I was having to deal with on a daily basis. If I could stay drunk, then I didn't really have to face the issue. I was a do-nothing husband. My kids were young. My two oldest were young at the time. And Many times I would be working in my office and my kids, two-year-old, would come busting in and my first reaction was, honey, get them out of here. What are you doing letting them come up here? This is ridiculous. I'm trying to work. This was the kind of husband that I was. Understanding that my two-year-old, I probably could have spent about a minute or 30 seconds with her 
And she would have probably been off to doing something else. But I was so wrapped up in success and money and all the things that we as men think are important. See, because I didn't have that dad walking alongside me, I bought into everything that the world says you need to be as a man. The money, success, power, sex. I thought in college that it was the conqueror of women. That's how you proved your manhood. I thought it was how much beer you could drink. How many beers you could drink until you passed out. That proved what kind of man you were. That's how distorted my view of manhood was because I didn't have that solid faith. I was living in shame and unworthiness. Shame because I found the gun that my dad killed himself with two weeks before he killed himself. I was an 11-year-old kid playing around the, in the, the floor of the closet, and I came ac across this sawed-off shotgun. And I remember thinking, wow, this is really cool. And within a few seconds, my dad over the back of me said, son, don't you ever tell anybody you found this. Now get out of here. I struggled with unworthiness because I thought, you know what? My dad can leave me like that? Who else am I supposed to be like? Why is everybody else really going to care? I struggled with this victim mentality at the same time. You see, people are, are really good, and I really played this victim mentality. I mean, I probably couldn't have worn, oh, won some type of Academy Award for it because I love living with this. Well, you don't know what I'm dealing with. Well, you didn't have a dad commit suicide. Well, you didn't have this. You didn't have that. So I could always use that as an excuse to then justify my behavior of drinking or doing whatever it is that I was doing. We've got to, as people, we've got to be able to step out of that. At some point, you've got to come to the realization, man, I can no longer blame my dad or this, that, or the other for, for my actions. I'm responsible for those actions. But I love living in that victim mentality. I didn't understand the generational curse. We got to interview John Eldridge for the full-length film, and he's just so good at what he does and, and the message and what he talks about. And he started talking about the generational curse and how most of us, I think, think of it as an addiction, like maybe an addiction that gets passed down. Alcoholism, drug addiction, you name it. But there's these other things like fear, rejection, anger, pornography, all of those things can get passed down through generations. And we as men have to be willing to take a step and step up and say, you know what? No longer is that going to happen in my house. We've got to be willing to do that, but you have to be aware at the same time of what's happening. There was a time that when I was selling plastics, I would travel to Nashville, Tennessee, about once a quarter. And I said I had an unlimited expense account and would travel in and it got to a point where I was meeting this one customer. We wouldn't even go to his plan any longer. He was an alcoholic, I was an alcoholic, so it was a perfect story. We would meet down the strip in Nashville and literally we started that night, started drinking about 4 p.m. I get back to my hotel that night, the next morning, should I say, at 4 a.m. We drank for 12 hours. I had to catch an early flight back to Dallas. And I remember getting up, getting in the rented car, and I'm driving back to Dallas. And like I had done a thousand times before, I said, God, I'll never do that again. I'll never drink again. I'm not going to do that. I, this hungover thing is not working for me. I promise you, Lord, I'm never going to do that again. Knowing full well that I would probably do it the next week that I was traveling. And in the midst of that drive, I remember the first time ever I said, okay, God, you are going to have to slap me upside the face to get my attention. Little piece of advice, never challenge God. It doesn't end well for you. It was about three months later that God took me to this place of brokenness. Uh, my life was falling apart, my family, my marriage, uh, my kids. There was just so much going on. So February 20th, 2009, I finally, I call, I tell people that it was my true salvation. You know, I was saved when I was nine and baptized, but, but February 20th, 2009 is when 
God really started to radically change my life. It's the first time I can say I totally surrendered. That I totally surrendered to God. And in that moment, he began starting to work in me and began this journey of sharing my story and really coming to understand other people's stories. So um, I found a counselor. Not a lot of men. There's this stereotype and myth out there that men, we shouldn't have to go see counselors. That's a crock. Man, you want to be real. You want to be transparent. You want to be vulnerable. That's a real man. Forget this, you, don't, you can't cry stuff. You want to be real? You show emotion. The problem we have is that we're teaching kids from a very young age, four and five years old, little boys, and when they fall down the, on the soccer field, baseball field, they're not supposed to cry, suck it up, be a man. We're teaching little boys they can't be real. They can't show real emotion. So then we wonder why we have a group Millions of men who can't communicate with their wives and be real and share the struggles and issues that they have. Man, there's nothing better than being able to have a real conversation with another man about your own issues and struggles with your wife. Being able to share those things, it does not get any better than that. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to do life in community, right? That's what we as men have to start doing a better job of. And we've got to get beyond the stereotype or the myth that we can't do that. So, I go see this counselor, and every week I would tell my wife, hey, don't tell anyone. I'm going to see a counselor. Because of this myth, right? And every week it was a struggle. I was like, man, I, can, I ain't going to go. And then sure enough, I go. And every time I walked out the back door of his office, I was thanking God. Because there was something that he was showing me every session that was revealing my you know, issues and my behavior. And it was in one of those sessions that, you know, the, the movies and the TV shows where they'll show where the person talking to the other person, their voice kind of goes silent, and this other person's thinking stuff in their head. Well, I, it was kind of one of those moments in the sense that I remember kind of seeing him talk, but I wasn't hearing what he was saying. And God said to me, how can you be so bitter, resentful, and angry towards a man who doesn't know how to be a father? It was in that moment that God gave me forgiveness and that I forgave my dad, and it radically changed my life. You see, carrying around this incredible weight of forgive, unforgiveness is like carrying 10 big, hefty trash bags full of weights. And you're trying to go through your daily life with this incredible burden on your back. That's what it's like carrying around the unforgiveness. There's, every, every person's story is different, but there are some common themes within each story and, and, and really common steps that all of us have to take. And the first thing is to admit that we're wounded. That's the biggest, most difficult step, especially for men, because of the pride issue. We don't want to admit that we're wounded, right? We don't want to admit that we have struggles with pride. We want to man up, suck it up, figure it out on our own. But to admit that we're wounded, to go there, that's what it's all about. And in the film, you'll see, I think you saw, we say nine out of ten people have a father. John Eldridge would argue that 10 out of 10 have a father. We're all wounded in some way. I wounded my kids. But admitting that you're wounded is the first step. The second step is inviting God into the room. You can't do this on your own. Man, it's a God thing. And he can take that wound and heal it in ways that you cannot even fathom. And he can give you a life that you've never imagined. The third thing is to seek counsel. Seek a pastor. I'm a huge advocate of Christian counseling. Uh, my guy, Dr. Tom, I would probably not be where I'm at today without him. He was my errand to Moses. He's the one that really helped guide me through the journey. He called me out on my stuff, but yet he encouraged me and loved me and supported me. And really, he asked me questions that I could have never asked myself. 
would have never been able to get to where I was at without him really digging in and, and knowing what he was doing. And then the fourth thing is to forgive. You know, forgiveness for your father can be the greatest blessing that you need to receive. And it can be the greatest gift that you ever can have received. My life after forgiveness, as God started this new transformation in me, um, the thing about forgiveness is it's difficult. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's something that's very difficult, but it is incredibly well worth it. There's a saying that I read not too long ago, and it said, you know, we all want the resurrection without the crucifixion. See, we all want the healing without the heartache. But yet it's in the heartache that God does his best work in us. It's in the process that he purifies us in ways that he would never be able to do before. So as God began this journey in me, this three-month period of, I mean, there was times where I was, my wife would go off to kick box and I'd get the kids off to school, man, and I was just coming back in my recliner and I was weeping. It was the purification process. And it was in that, that time period that God revealed that to me in that counseling session. But once God really started once I found forgiveness for my father and I started this journey, he began re to reveal things to me that, that were mind-blowing in, in my legacy and the things that I was able to do at home as a husband, father, and man. So, for example, a few of the things was modeling. You know, understanding that the way I love my wife is what my girls are going to look to and expect in their husband. So if I'm verbally or physically abusive to my wife, guess what? Odds are my girls are going to marry or date or be involved with somebody that's physically or verbally abusive because it becomes their norm. So what I do every morning is I get up and I wrap my arms around my girls, my wife in front of my girls because I want them to know there's no doubt that dad loves mom more than anything in the world. And so when they walk out to school that day, that's one less thing they have to worry about. They know dad loves mom. And I'm setting the standard by which they're going to measure every other man, husband, and father. The second thing is that I, I learned is prayer, the power of prayer. We interviewed Neil Jeffrey, who was in the short film. and He is a, a former NFL player. And he takes all the credit for Dan Fouts, for some of the old guys. He takes all the credit for Dan Fouts uh, being such an incredible quarterback in the uh, Chargers because he says he puts so much pressure on him. And Neil is passionate about speaking into men's lives. And one of the things he said to me, he said, John, he said, you know, my dad was a prayer warrior. And he said, man, there were days where I did not want to pray. I didn't want to face anything after the game. It was just horrible. And he said, my dad would say, huddle up, son, we're going to pray. We're going to thank And he said, one time, and I'll never forget it, he turns to me and he said, John, there's nothing like a child hearing his father pray for him out loud with that manly, fatherly voice. And I remember thinking, wow, that's pretty good. So I go back home that night, and I told my wife, I said, you know what, prayer time tonight's changed. I got some wisdom from Neil Jeffrey. Up until that point, I would say this Incredible prayer, which you guys can imagine, I'm sure, as all fathers do, right? We're all, you know, very, very articulate in our prayers. I would say this incredible prayer, you know, most of the time I'm probably bat patting myself on the back as I walk out of the kids' room. But I said, you know what? Tonight, what can I pray for you about, Brooke? What can I pray for you about, Ellie? What can I pray for you about, Sydney? And what that does is that lets them see that I have a genuine interest in what's going on in their lives. And they hear me take their concerns and worries to the Father on their behalf. It also leads to additional conversations so that when they say, Dad, will you pray for me about this test tomorrow? That I'm able to say, hey, what are you, why are you worried about the test? What's going on? The last thing 
that I've learned that's been probably one of the most impacting things is asking for forgiveness. As a dad, man, I mess up all the time. I don't have this thing figured out. Anybody that says they do, and, you know, I'm not sure I would trust. Fatherhood is about, it's not about perfection. It's about progress. And when I make mistakes, maybe I talk to my girls in a bad tone. I say something. I lose it. Maybe I lose it. I'm having a bad day, and I get angry, and I say something I shouldn't say. I now go to my girls, and I'm able to t- talk to them one-on-one. And I say, you know what, Brooke? Dad's so messed up. I should not have said that. I shouldn't have did this, whatever. Will you forgive me? And I walk them through. You know what? Here, I had a bad day. Or I walk them through what exactly happened. You know what they, they see is they see dad's doing the very best he can. He's not perfect. And what's cool about that is they understand they don't have to be perfect either. Which is important because a lot of kids think that they have this thing to live up to. When as we as parents realize and, and, and relay the message to them that's about being real. And about sharing with them some of our own struggles and trials. That's what it's all about. That levels the playing field, if you will. There's a couple of verses, you know, for me, that were my lifesavers. Um, one was Hebrews 13, 5. When I was going through this period of forgiveness, and even after the fact, I put it on my mirror, I put it on the refrigerator, I put it all over as a reminder. One of the most important ones was Hebrews 13, 5, and it says, And Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I would capitalize the word never. Because I was the abandonment issue. I was so scared. And I needed that affirmation every day that I knew Jesus wasn't going to leave me. There's another one, uh, Romans 8, 1, that says, There's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. That was another one that totally made sense to me because... I felt condemned and ashamed and embarrassed for most of my life. You see, I, I walked around thinking that people were whispering, hey, there's the, there's the little kid whose dad killed himself. So I had that scarlet letter, if you will. That's what I struggled with. And I still struggle with that today at times. The unworthiness. You know, Coach Hines talked about it earlier t- today. Times of feeling unworthy, right? And not good enough or not, you know, the way we should be or hitting a certain level that we should be on. There's a, another quote, and it's one of the, the, my favorite ones by Thomas Fuller. It says, he that cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. For every man has need to be forgiven. That along with the Matthew 6:14. 15 that was in the short film, just the, the importance of forgiveness. How can we expect God and others to forgive us if we're not willing to forgive others? It's so very important, forgiveness, and what it can do in your life. Three things I want to remind you kind of as we wrap up here. Um, There was an old man in the film, 84 years old, named Dennis. His message was very clear to me. It's never too late. He was 84 years old when he came to finally forgive his dad. And there's a piece there in the short film, and he talks about it. He says, you know, for the first time in 84 years, I finally went to bed in peace. Doesn't matter what your story is, where you've been. Doesn't matter how old you are. If you're a father from your son or your daughter if you're a daughter or son you need forgiveness from your father doesn't matter it's never too late to be forgiven the second thing is you're not alone you would not believe the number of people that I have reach out to me that for whatever reason think they're the only one struggling with this issue and if you hear nothing else today here you are not alone you see Satan had convinced me that I was the only one struggling with this issue and that I was all alone. And you know what that does for a man? It takes him into isolation. And isolation is man's greatest enemy. Just like a, a lion hunting antelope or whatever, uh, whatever animal you can think of, they always wait until that one struggling toward the end, right? The 
one loner that's coming up by himself, that's lagging behind, that's the one you attack. What do you think Satan does? You get in isolation, you start withdrawing from people, man, he is going to be all over you. We can't isolate it when you're not alone. The third thing is, if I can do this, anybody can. What God has done in my life, he can do in your life and so, so much more. I asked my wife, not long after God started this transformation in me, and she saw the change uh, and really began to believe in, in what we were doing and the mission and trying to spread the message. And, and I said, honey, do you have any regrets? And she turned to me, and I'll never forget it. It was bittersweet. And she said, you know, the only regret I have is that the John Finch I know today is not the John Finch I had for the first 14 years of my marriage. Forgiveness changes legacy. It's life-changing in ways you cannot even fathom. God wants to start you on that journey to forgiveness. He gave me a second chance. be the man, the husband, and the father that he created me to be, today he's going to give you a second chance. Maybe a first chance. I talked with Will last night a little bit. I'm going to ask for a couple of a couple of guys to step up, Coach Hines and maybe Will. Uh, go ahead and come up, guys. Stand here at the front. Here's what I want to do for those of you who've been wounded and want healing. There's some of you out there right now that are sitting that a dad said, you'll never amount to anything. Maybe he said words that you still remember to this day that have wounded you, that have angered you, that have scarred you. This moment is for you. Take a step toward forgiveness. Come down front and let us, pray, let us pray a special blessing over you. For any of you, as we just continue, we're going to take a couple of minutes to just give you the opportunity. Don't shy away. Don't be hesitant. Take a step. It's, it's a life that God wants to give you that you never imagined, but you have to be willing to take a step. Just a couple of minutes, we'll wait. Maybe it was a dad that never said the words, I love you and I'm proud of you. And it was in, in that that you went out and you gathered all the materialistic things that you gathered all the successes of what you believed he wanted you to be and all you wanted to do was to hear I'm proud of you brother and I love you and you never heard that maybe it was a dad that was physically or verbally abusive that said things to you that, that you can't imagine any father saying Maybe it was a dad that abandoned you because of death or disinterest or divorce, whatever it might be. I'm going to be around to hang out and talk, so if any of you want to want to chat and visit, man, I'd love to, love to hear your story, love to be able to visit with you and, and help in any way I can, so uh, let me know if if, uh, if you want to chat, I'll be over here and just be hanging around as long as I need to. Thanks again, John. Appreciate it. Uh, this has been what a day. It's been a long day. Boy, it's heavy now. But I want to challenge you guys. First of all, John is very serious with the fact that he's going to be here. Uh, don't walk away today. Said, let, let, let me pray for us today, and let me just pray for all of you guys. Pray for the foundation, and we just give thanks for what we, we experienced here today. 
Dear Lord, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for what you're doing right now. For the people in these seats that are struggling. Thank you for your consistency that you're always going to be there for them. Thank you for your voice in their hearts right now. They know your call. Lord, I pray that you give them courage for there not be fear in front of someone, but to be aware that they reach out, that they have wounds, whether it be with a father or anything in life. Lord, I pray that you give them that courage. Let us know as a family here today how we can help each other. We have friends. Lord, thank you for everyone that came to hear this message this week. That a lot of us traveled across the country to be a part of something that maybe we didn't all understand. But we understand now that your presence is with this foundation, is with this message, and you are going to grow it exponentially beyond what we can even imagine because with you, all things are possible. Lord, I pray that you walk with each of these individuals as they leave here and they make a greater impact for you because of their understanding of why. They understand Thank you guys.